podcasting from the heart of the Gator Nation in Alachua County, Florida, this is Extension Cord, the podcast of UF IFAS Extension Alachua County, where we plug in and bring UF IFAS Extension to life. Good morning, everybody. This is Dr. Taylor Clem with UF IFAS Extension here in Alachua County, Florida, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Extension Cord. So today, uh, we have Dr. Jared Daniels. He has a, uh, is a professor of entomology at the University of Florida and curator at the Florida Museum of Natural History's McGuire Center for Lepidoptera and Biodiversity. Dr. Daniels, he's received his BS from St. John's University in Minnesota and a PhD from the University of Florida. An entomologist by training, he specializes in the ecology and conservation of at-risk butterflies and other native insect pollinators. And I want us to talk today all about Lepidoptera, the research that you're doing. So Dr. Daniels, thank you very much and thank you for joining us. Oh, thanks so much, Taylor. It's really a pleasure to be here today. Yeah, I, you know, I kind of gave this like introduction kind of talking a little bit about, you know, what you're currently doing. I mean, if anybody has ever been at the uh, Butterfly Museum here in town, here in Gainesville, you know, they're, they're seeing a lot of that research. You're able to look in on it. But I want to hear a little bit more about yourself and how you ended up in this position where, you know, the research that you're doing, which we'll dive into, but it's it's kind of all based and bound around Lepidoptera. Yeah, well, I, I, I grew up luckily in a very rural part of Wisconsin. So I had a very supportive mom and dad that uh, allowed me to explore kind of the back 40 of our land. And I was always interested in insects, obviously, and butterflies were particularly um, just amazing to me. I, I thought that they were uh, pretty spectacular. And um, actually, when I was about six years old, my grandfather brought over a coffee, an old coffee can with these large Cecropia caterpillars inside and they spun cocoons. And when they first emerged, I thought that was like the best thing since sliced bread. So I was pretty much hooked at that <laughs> point on knowing I wanted to work with insects. And, uh, you know, I didn't want to be a traditional entomologist. I wanted to work on conservation. And this was right when sort of the field of insect conservation was starting to tick upward a little bit. So I, I hit it at a really good time and uh, it allowed me to kind of marriage my two interests of insects and conservation together. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I, you know, we're thinking about conservation and insects, you know, there's, there's a lot of times when, you know, when I'm talking with homeowners, they think of the, the bad insects that are in their landscape. But I always like to tell them like, that's such a small, small, small percentage of just the, all the different species, at least we just have here in Florida. Um, and when we think of insect conservation, the, sometimes people don't put those together because of we're trying to conserve insects. Why, why are insects so important that we have a whole field devoted to conservation? Well, that's a, that's a big question, but I mean, why <laughs> aren't insects important is kind of the better mm -hmm. question. I mean, they, they provide so many really key services to the environment and to humanity, everything from decomposition and nutrient recycling to natural pest mm -hmm. control. And then you look at the service of pollination just as a really good example. You know, globally about 87.5% of all flowering plants on this planet rely on animals for moving pollen from one flower to another to set seed and fruit. The bulk of that service is delivered by insects. So they're fundamental uh, ecosystem engineers for really maintaining healthy natural environments. And in Florida, as a good example, we have about 200 different agricultural commodities and that list is go growing and growing. And many of them require the service of pollination. So they're, they're intricately tied to the health of those systems, the productivity, productivity of those systems, and our agricultural economy. So Without insects, we would have a, a pretty hard time surviving on this planet. Yeah. So, I mean, their role is so important. I, I imagine if we had to put employee of the month signs up all over every single month, it'd always be a certain pollinator because the important role, their vital role in 
our economic success as a as a state and country, um, but also their significant role in just in environmental quality. Um, you know, there's numerous insects, but if we're thinking about their being at the bottom of almost like the, the food web, but their role that they have there, and you put a lot of research, you know, specifically Lepidoptera. So that is kind of like your big field of research. Could you explain what Lepidoptera is essentially to the layman? Because I know we're going to be talking a lot about that because you mentioned butterflies, but that's not the only part of Lepidoptera. Yes. Yeah, so Lepidoptera is just um, the term for butterflies and moths. And so it's one of the most diverse orders of insects out there. And it's a great one to study just because they're very visible. They're taxonomically well known. Um, you can get a lot of data on them. They've also been used for many, many years with citizen science. But I think even more importantly for kind of engaging that public sphere, butterflies, you know, and some moths are, they're really iconic. They're beautiful. They're harmless. So they're a natural gateway, a natural ambassador to talking about insects as a whole and why they're important and getting people enthusiastic about helping with insect conservation. And just as a good example, you, you know, with all the, you know, papers and media attention on pollinator decline and loss, so much has been focused around the monarch butterfly mm -hmm. as yeah. this kind of sentinel organism. And it, it's just because it's such an iconic organism. It's such a, a visible one. It's, it's essentially cosmopolitan. It occurs pretty much everywhere we, we occur within the United States. It can be found in urban areas, rural areas. Um, it has this fascinating mass annual fall migration. It, it, you know, it crosses borders from Canada, the U.S., and Mexico, so it's, it, there's a cultural and spiritual element to it. Uh, so it's a great way of talking about how agencies and individuals can make a difference with insect conservation. Uh, so you can rally around that one organism and say, well, I can create monarch habitat in my backyard, but what you're really creating is insect and wildlife habitat. It's not just about the monarch. Yeah, you're planning for one species, but in actuality, you're creating an ecosystem or environment for a multitude of different species. And, you know, you're bringing in different types of insects, you're bringing in birds as well. And those birds have significant roles in our environment. Um, so I like, I like the idea is like the butterflies are a gateway to just in, the importance of insects. And if anybody has never seen the videos of the migrations in Mexico of when the monarchs all converge, I highly recommend seeing it. Um, it's just they are millions of them just flying around. I'm not sure which region of uh, Mexico that, that occurs, it's, though. It's in Michoacan, which is kind of northwest of Mexico City. And, and actually, the Florida Museum does eco-tours in collaboration with Holbrook Travel in Gainesville to take people there. And I'm one of the leaders along with Dr. Andre Surikov at the Florida Museum. So once, you know, once the pandemic resolves itself and we're back to travel, it's certainly a destination that I highly recommend because there is no other place on the planet you can actually hear butterflies because there are so many wing beats. And the last two years have been a little bit of uptick in numbers. And it's, it's um, for lack of a better term, it's like be being in a monarch snow globe. It's like just enveloped <laughs> with butterflies and nowhere else in the world can you kind of have that experience. So it's a, it's kind of a life-changing event and opportunity to see that. Yeah, that, that's a trip that's on my bucket list. <laughs> um, so, you know, when we talk about pollinators, the, the lepidopteras or the butterflies or the moths, they're, they are a pollinator, but they're not the only pollinator. Um, so what are some of the other common pollinators that you are working with? And then I want to kind of dive in like the importance of more about the importance of pollinator and the impacts that we're seeing happen currently in Florida that what makes insects con conservation important to think about. Sure. So there, there's a, a lot of different groups of insects that act as pollinators, everything from obviously butterflies and moths to flies, beetles, wasps. But kind of the most effective and efficient pollinating group are, are bees, both the Western honeybee and, of course, native bees, because they're actually going to a blossom 
with the purpose of not only getting some nectar, but they're collecting pollen for their developing brood. So they're, they're, they're actually really doing the heavy lifting of making sure they get a good pollen load as they navigate that environment. But really, realistically, all these organisms do move pollen around the environment and are really key. And what we, what we know from a lot of studies, particularly from agricultural environments, is that having that background of diversity of different types of pollinators is really critical to the health and productivity of these systems. It's not just one organism like the Western honeybee, but if you look at a crop like blueberry, uh, which is you know a major crop in Florida, the more floral visits that insects make, the more diversity of insects making those floral visits, often the larger, more symmetrical berries you create, even things, you know, higher yields, even potentially earlier uh, development of those berries. So that diversity that exists in the background, majority of that being free of charge to growers and to humanity is really, really critical. So we can't, we can't rely on just one single organism to do that heavy lifting. Um, and what we have seen globally is that a lot of insects um, are starting to show pretty steep declines. And there's been a lot of scientific papers generated about this and a lot of debate within the community about, you know, the accuracy of this decline and, and how much is actually happening. But I think what we know clearly is that biodiversity is declining rapidly on this planet. And if we see that extending into insects, then really the security of our agricultural systems, the health of our environment is going to suffer. And so that background diversity is critical to ensuring that we have healthy productive systems in which to live and, and benefit from. Yeah, absolutely. Because when you're, when you're talking about the, the role that those pollinators play, you're looking at a diverse population and a high population, so a high quantity of pollinators and you know, we mentioned that role within an agricultural setting, but that is equally as important because it's easier to a certain extent to add an economic value to ag commodities, um, agricultural commodities, but those pollinators are equally as important for our entire natural ecosystem with uh, helping with genetic diversity of different plant material by pollinating different trees or shrubs, native perennials, et cetera. So, their role is vital for just environmental quality overall, even though Definitely. sometimes it's harder to put an economic value on those. And, and I think the other th important thing to add about the diversity is that that background diversity of different species, different groups of insects, it, it also buffers uh, the impacts of change, like climate change, habitat loss, and fragmentation, because you have so many different life histories, so many different behaviors. You're not just relying on one single organism that has, you know, it, it is a colonial organism or it nests here or it feeds on this, but you have that, that whole huge diversity and richness behind you, uh, making sure that if one or two organisms decline or go extinct, the rest of them can buffer that overall decline. So it's, it's kind of that, it's kind of analogous to maintaining a diverse stock portfolio, you know, in good times, all the stocks go up in bad times, some go down, but some make sure you have a, a solid, you know, still fundamental base. And so we have to ensure that that portfolio of species that we have existing in the natural world is as robust as possible so that it can deal with changes that are happening now and will happen in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Because it, it adds a level of resilience, you know, it, it does it an impact rather than being a major impact environmentally. I mean, we don't want those impacts to occur, period. But when there is that impact, that population is diverse enough where it has a high resilience so it can recover quickly. Um, and when you mentioned climate change, you know, I think that's a good way to kind of step into that part of the conversation. We're talking about what are those impacts? You know, when we're thinking about insect conservation, that makes me think when we're, we're putting in that frame that there is a reason that we need to make sure that we're conserving our insect populations. So that means there's impacts that's occurring with those, with those populations. You're talking about the, uh, the biodiversity loss or decline. 
you know, climate change? What are some of those other concerns that we're seeing here in Florida um, that are having impacts on our pollinators and our insects that make us really have to start to think, what are we going to do or what can we do? Well, I think the, the biggest driver of decline, you know, across the planet is, is uh, loss of habitat. So in Florida, we see a lot of natural habitat being developed, being fragmented, uh, being impacted one way or another from, you know, human causes. And I think that's a, that's a huge problem. And even, even impacts that we don't always think about, say light pollution that will affect nighttime pollinators or the moth community or other insects. We look at uh, drift and impact from say mosquito control abatement or agricultural chemicals, uh, and then just the, the bigger loss of habitat. So uh, that that's a, a huge worry as we look at the functionality of these systems moving forward. So one thing I, I think that is beneficial about working with insects is that for many of them, they don't need a lot of space to be happy to survive well. And so really thinking about all the landscapes that we we live in and we we see on a daily basis. How can we adapt and modify those landscapes or change the management of those landscapes even just a little bit so that they're beneficial or they support more uh, of the insect community and general wildlife in in general? So a good example might be your backyard. You know, if you have uh, a new home where you might have a few foundation trees or shrubs but do you have a lot of diversity of plants that are blooming that are maybe native? And so by making small singular steps, like adding a little bit of diversity, you can really build up the opportunity for resources for these organisms to utilize your landscape and simple changes can make big impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I always like to use the road trip analogy when I'm talking about you know, as part of the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, and also one of the reasons I thought it'd be great to bring you on here is one of the principles is the attracting wildlife. So, you know, if it's birds, um, any, any wildlife, but especially pollinators. And when I talk about, you know, within the landscapes, because that's where we're having a major land use shift is those environments, those natural environments are shifting to more urbanizing areas. So there's that loss of environment. So I talk, I use the road trip analogy when I'm talking with the public about the importance of providing habitat for wildlife and pollinators. So I always like to say, how many of you go on road trips? And I'm like, oh, everyone raises their hands because obviously people have gone on road trips before. Um, and then I say, if you go on a road trip, you're planning to go on a road trip, how important is it for you to make sure that you have a place to stay, like a hotel, if you're camping or whatever it is? I'm like, oh, yeah, of course. How important is it to make sure that you have ways to get gas along the way? Oh, it's important. I need to make sure I get gas because otherwise I'm not going to go very far. What about water? What about food? And they're like, well, yeah, these are all very important things. I say, okay, insects and our wildlife are the same way. We, fragged, we fragmented these landscapes. And they need to get from essentially one natural, try to get them from one natural community to another. And along the way is their road trip, essentially, from one point A to point B. But if they don't have shelter, if they don't have food or water or anything like that along the way, can they successfully travel between point A and point B? And then, oh, no. <laughs> so I, I, I like to use that analogy because I think that's just an easy way to kind of connect the dots because pollinators need that. And that's why it's important to make those little steps within our, just our, our landscapes, our residential landscapes, even if it's as simple as putting a, a native perennial in that's a pollen source or a host plant for some of the Lepidoptera. Yeah, and I, and I think we, we, we do have to look at how we, manage these landscapes that we see regularly, roadsides, you know, utility easements, agricultural land and, and suburban urban environments, because these are spaces, like you said, that have been modified to where they're not so wildlife friendly right now, but we can add a little bit back to that environment that will, you know, make the resources more accessible to these organisms, provide habitat, provide nesting resources, provide food, and then we start rebuilding that habitat over that larger network. And, you know, if you do it in your yard and I do it in my yard and then my neighborhood adopts it, then we're making big changes, you know, and, and I, I think 
the other thing that's that's critical is you know all these landscapes are managed. Uh, you look at roadsides, whether they're main they're maintained for safety, but there are a lot of really key environmental services that those roadsides provide. Uh, you know, beautification, erosion control, but they're habitat for many different insects. So if, if we could just manage them a little bit different where we don't sacrifice costs or safety, but we really boost the biodiversity benefit of them, then we all win. The idea is to build healthy communities for both wildlife and humans to coexist. Yeah. And I think I, that's one thing, I, you know, when I saw you present recently at the Master Gardener Volunteer Conference, you were talking about the, the pollinator highway and some of that research that you've been doing um, regarding pollinators and work that you've been doing with the Department of Transportation or DOT. I would love for you to kind of share a little bit about that research and essentially kind of expounding on just what you're talking about and what you've learned in that research. Well, it's just a little bit of backstory. I always really liked roadsides because growing growing up, they were often places that you could easily find insects. There were often really cool plant species there, uh, often you know rare plants that you couldn't find in the natural environment because the natural environment was gone, but you could still find them in roadways. So when I came down to Florida and um, you know saw like in March and April these roadsides full of Coreopsis and flocks in full bloom. I, I just thought that was amazing. But you know, when you talk to uh, people, they they don't value roadsides at all. They just think of them as these linear strips that really have no value. But when you actually go out there and you look, you find all sorts of wonderful insects and plants. And so we approached the Department of Transportation to ask them, you know how do you manage roadways in Florida? And of course they, they mow them and the frequency of mowing varies a lot. And in Alachua County, that frequency in many areas was about every three or four weeks, which seems, seems crazy, right? It seems like it's a lot of mowing. And so we, we wanted to ask the question, if you change that mowing frequency, what impact would that have on the amount of bloom that was out there and the insect community that was responding to those available blossoms. So the Department of Transportation gave us a, a, a nice, uh, you know, small grant to, to look at this in, in more detail. And we examined three different mowing frequencies, no mow, which, you know, of course, not mowing over the course of the whole year, every three weeks, which was the standard in Alachua County, and then every six weeks, double the standard. And what we found when we went out, we, we measured and recorded all the different species of flowers. We, we found, we counted the number of blooms, and we collected the insects that were using that habitat. And ultimately, what we found is that if you go from three weeks to six weeks, that little reduction in mowing had significant impact on the amount of bloom that was available and the abundance of insects that use those roadways. So that, that didn't sacrifice any safety. It, it actually saved money in the process, but the impact was really huge, right? You could, you could beautify that landscape. You had much more resources and you had a, a real boost in the insect abundance in that area. And then the other thing we did kind of alongside that is a lot of people were, were sort of worried that, okay, if you plant it and they come, are they going to wander out into the road and get hit by a car? Are, are we are we sort of attracting these insects to their doom? And so we, we actually looked at the same kind of variables of, of mowing frequency and we recorded all the dead insects along the road adjacent to those areas. And what we found is that in areas where mowing took place with regularity, the mortality rate went way up, but where areas that had a lot of resources, the insects stayed where the resources are they didn't go across the road. And so if you, if you plant it, they will come, but they don't necessarily get killed. So it was a, it was a real positive. And, and so we, we took that information back to DOT and, uh, you know, we're trying to work with them on, on ad adapting their, their management practices for, for road size, because there's so many benefits. It, it is actually the most familiar landscape for the majority of Americans. We see that every day. Mm -hmm. It's the most visible landscape in North America, really. Yeah. Wow. I, you know, 
I think one of the things that like popped into my head when talking about that research, well, two things is uh, the insert insect mortality that I really like that, that, that we're seeing that the population increase, but I guess if that food to the shelter and everything that they need is there localized, they don't necessarily have to go from one stand to the other or one little plot to the other. They're able to find the resources very easily. But um, the, how, how did you do that collection of the insect mortality rates? Because that was one, I imagine like you cleaning the front of someone's car really, really nicely. And then they just drive down the highway and just kind of do a count at the end of a certain Well, we, we just, uh, you know, most of this work was done by one of my graduate students, Dale Halberter, but he basically just walked along the roadways and, you know, looked down very carefully and recorded all the insects that he found a carcass for. So, uh, you know, it's the same way we, we would monitor roadkill for other wildlife, but insects are often not thought of as roadkill or as, you know, casualties of that, but they're so ubiquitous that of course they're going to be. And, you know, and there are caveats, you know, migratory butterflies and, and it certainly didn't, you know, eliminate the mortality. But the important point was in areas where resources exist, they tend to stay where those resources are. So by mowing less and having more resources, you actually can validate that these are actually really good habitat and resources. And it's not going to be detrimental necessarily to the overall insect population. Wow, that's wonderful. And I think the, the other thing that seeing those, those impacts or those results of the research is huge because you're able to go to DOT and say, we were, with, by reducing your mowing by 50%, they're saving X amount of money, whatever that economic value is. Um, but then you can calculate how much of that is in carbon emissions from using those mowers, it's travel time to and from those uh, locations. But then you're saying, okay, so you can reduce that this is this economic value that is associated with this. But there's also this really high environmental value because we're finding that these are the impacts or these are the benefits of by just going from three-week frequency to six-week frequency. I mean, that's huge because it's just like, oh, well, that's, that's an easy way to kind of convince them to make these changes. But is it difficult now that you kind of have these kind of results from that study, um, or you've driven these conclusions, you draw these conclusions from that study, how are you working with them? You're, so you're working on creating new recommendations. Are you finding that it's easy to apply those recommendations uh, with DOT? And is it something that specifically you're going to see like state highways or are you seeing like counties get involved? Because I know sometimes different roads are maintained and overseen by different entities. Yeah. So that's a, that's an interesting question. So the, the kind of big answer is uh, DOT is, is, is very interested in, you know, how their work affects the safety of the general public, the environment, and partner organizations like, or agencies like Department of Agriculture, as an example. Um, and we, we also did a similar study looking at uh, kind of recording and, and actually databasing all the native milkweed plants along North Florida roadways for the monarch. And that, that was also kind of eye-opening in my mind because agencies really got interested in trying to rally behind the monarch. Uh, you know, the, the broader terms of biodiversity were important, but when you kind of focus it down to a singular organism, then I, I think it, it meant more to them a little bit. So they actually entered into this nationwide agreement with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to help conserve parts of roadways for monarch habitat. And that was, that was kind of moving the needle more than maybe some of the other research. But what we've, what we've tried to do is link how that land is managed to adjacent landscapes like farming communities and agriculture in general, because these are mobile organisms. They move across that landscape, you know, miles around where they nest or, or breed. So they're spilling over into, you know, a, a squash farm or to a blueberry farm. And so the impacts go well beyond just that boundary of that roadway. And I think if, if, if we're trying to look at how do we make agricultural landscapes more resilient and beneficial for pollinators, it's hard to do that 
on the grower land because you have to take land out of production to plant resources or, but why not use an existing landscape, which is never going to be built. It's, you know, nobody's going to build on a roadside. So it's always managed, but the impacts could be very influential, you know, even miles downstream. And so I think that's the, the way of looking at this is kind of that holistic, my, my land influences your land and your land influences your other neighbor's land. And if we look at that as, as we're doing something beneficial, not just for our own benefit, but for the broader community benefit, that's, yeah. that's where we kind of make strides. Yeah, it's a very altruistic perspective. And I, I imagine that when you're looking at how do you how do you end up prioritizing these these roadways because obviously DOT oversees certain roadways and if you're looking at the most value that you can get from selecting which roads have the best connectivity to certain natural systems and agriculture how are you, how are you prioritizing those well i think right now we 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 have mapped out like as an example with that that monarch project in in mapping milkweed we we mapped out where the like the super high density milkweed populations are, so we can that that would be a priority for conserving or managing differently than other road size because you don't want to mow at times when monarchs are util, utilizing those plants or when they're going to seed. So that's that's one part of the equation. The rest is just sort of kind of at that background level, trying to move the conversation forward for agencies like DOT to change their overall policies and procedures to say, okay, if we mow a little bit less, here are the talking points, the benefits that we can sell as an agency to, to others and to the general public. And the, one thing that did come out of the research is in collaboration with DOT, Department of Agriculture, and the Florida Wildflower Foundation, we, we started a, a media campaign called Why Roadsides Matter. And it's, it's trying to ultimately get information out there so the public understands that when they drive along roadways like on the turnpike, that these 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 spaces are really important and they, they're valuable and they should be viewed in a more positive light. And then the other audience is sort of the decision makers out there that if we can get people that are at the state legislator level to realize, hey, these are really important landscapes for agriculture or for, you know, key services for the environment, well, maybe we can more effectively mandate changes that are going to be mutually beneficial to all the agencies and, and the, the, the well-being of Florida as a, as a community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I think that could be a really neat, like, follow-up study. And it's probably something you've, you've thought about is, you know, looking at where are maybe agricultural lands that are along one of these pollinator highways. Say it's a highway that's designated as one of the pollinator highways and one that is not. Are you seeing that there's a certain influx in economic value or production value that you're getting from the agriculture that could be attributed to that? I think that'd be a really, really neat value that you can say, hey, because of this, it increased yield maybe X percent or the value of this uh, agricultural commodity. Um, yeah, have, have you talked about, yeah? Uh, definitely. I mean, we, we've, we've, we've thought about it. We, we finished up a, a larger nationwide project that Dr. Jamie Ellis and I were involved in called Integrated Crop Pollination that was funded by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And it looked at, um, you know, kind of enhancements on agricultural land and their ultimate benefit for increasing the pollinator diversity and the native bee abundance on crops. And we, we definitely saw that you know, if you have more diverse resources adjacent to crops, that you are going to get enhanced pollination service in general. It's it's a hard thing to measure, but from that research, it gives us the idea that yeah, these other landscapes, if they have a lot of resources, you're you're very likely to see that spillover effect into a farmer's field or a neighboring you know grower land. So it's something we definitely do want to follow up on. It's it is hard to effectively measure, but I think, um, I think it's worthwhile because we, we do need the data to suggest that there is, there is real science behind this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Um, I, you know, it's important we're talking about agriculture, 
Um, and, you know, we briefly mentioned when I'm thinking about space, like just in general, geographic space, I always imagine points, lines, and planes. And when I'm thinking about how we're creating these environments uh, for pollinators, these roadways become like a series of lines that connect these different habitats. Um, the homes, they become those points of space in space that they kind of little islands that pollinators can pop to and fro. And then having those, those points is important, having those lines are important that you can actually connect. So the pollinator highways, but then when you talk about the, the plane, so it's like a polygon, a two-dimensional shape. Um, and that's where I start to think about how maybe communities start to adopt different pollinator initiatives or maybe some other strategy that can be done to help protect pollinators or encourage plantings for different pollinators. Um, and, you know, this kind of switches gears a little bit, but I want to ask, you know, as part of the research that's happening with the museum and some of the other stuff that you've been working on, ha has there been much research looking at those like community initiatives as with pollinators or at least maybe Lepidoptera? Uh, there, there certainly is growing interest and growing um, research on sort of urban green space as being really valuable for um, wildlife in general, but increasingly for pollinators because of the, the space constraints. You don't need a lot of space. And also kind of coming at that from a side is creating these livable environments for the public to connect or reconnect to nature, to get outside for their own health, um, you know, making sure we have livable, healthy communities where humans and wildlife can coexist and butterflies and pollinators are kind of a good, you know, starting point because they're, they're, they're going to be there in those urban environments. You don't need a lot of habitat to make them happy. And for many of them, they're really visible. So if you, if you go into some of these spaces and the public sees, you know, butterflies flying around or bees visiting flowers, it's, it's a good sign that it's, you know, a productive, healthy, little system. And so I think there's, there's much more energy around how do we redesign or actually create more functional urban environments for people to, to live in, in harmony with nature. And, uh, you know, the, the recent figures from the United Nations um, and from the U.S. Census is about, in the U.S., about 80% of the American public now lives in or near cities. So if we don't make these environments you know, livable and enjoyable and provide opportunities for people to connect to nature, we're, we're losing a lot. And I think the pandemic kind of brought that out, right? It's an opportunity for us to maybe sit back and enjoy our yard more than we have and realize that we've been missing a lot by just staring at a computer screen all day. We need to really be part of this living world around us in a more enjoyable way for our own benefit, as well as you know, how do we make it even better for the wildlife we want to see? Mm -hmm, absolutely. I, um, I think about, you know, that in, what are those behaviors? Because I, I work a lot with homeowners and I know with the museum you're working with, you interact a lot with the public and there's always conversations like, what can I do at my home or what can I do within my community to like even small behaviors? And so many of those things with behaviors is not necessarily just un the knowledge gain, you know, so it's important to understand like what you need to do in order to attract pollinators. But I, there's also that like social norm and that and exactly what you mentioned, that connectedness to nature, understanding what our connection is because we're dependent on a healthy connection with our environment. And it, when we're disconnected, we lose, we lose touch or sense of what's happening around us. So if we have that connectedness, it's, easier for just homeowners to adopt little changes. Um, have you noticed, like, I know when people are coming up to the museum and they're looking at uh, some of the exhibits and everything, have you noticed, like, any trends that come through with, like, the, the public on just their interest in butterflies? Or are you seeing that there's a lot of interest in, like, how can we start our own butterfly gardens within our home landscapes? There, there's a lot of interest in, in how to 
just create habitat for wildlife. We we have at the museum we have, you know, regular plant sales, and those have been wildly successful because people they're they're interested in plants and particularly native plants, and and they wanna they they wanna create an environment that you know can be more enjoyable. They 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 walk into the butterfly rainforest exhibit as an example, and they come out and they want to create that in their home yard or, or neighborhood. And, and, you know, the nice thing about attracting pollinators and insects and butterflies is it doesn't, doesn't take a lot to make that happen. You know, those, those little changes can, can be really important. And, and the, the nice thing about it is like with the monarch, you know, if you go and you create a little habitat that has some blooming plants and a couple of milkweed species, chances are you're going to have a monarch come to your property and so it, it, it's a validation that I, I can really make a difference, that you know, I can see it happening. And I think for a lot of people, that's really important. They, they want to understand that they are making a positive impact and the reinforcement of actually seeing these organisms come and, you know, is, is really validating. And so it, it gets them really excited. And we, we also get a lot of comments uh, from people, I get a lot of emails uh, people that maybe have visited the museum or the butterfly rainforest exhibit, and they'll send an email saying, I just was there. I really love my experience. And I went home and now I have all these butterflies in my yard. Where did they come from? And they, they've been there all the time, of course, but now you are aware of them. You're looking for them. And, and so it's just opening your eyes to, to take in all this wonderful diversity around us. And so I, I think that's, what's great about working with insects that it doesn't take, a lot to get real excitement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I remember one time I was installing a new landscape and I had a pollinator plant and I didn't even have it in the ground yet completely. And it already had pollinators on it. And it was just, it was instantaneous. This landscape that it, it didn't have any pollinators really in it. And just bringing in a few had a major change. They, they arrived almost instantly. Um, and that was satisfying for me. I was like, whoa, look at this. <laughs> but, you know, but you're 100% right, that awareness, it just, you see it all of a sudden. It kind of like, you're used to being like looking at the world from this perspective and all of a sudden it kind of like opens up. You're seeing so much more. And that's an easy way to kind of step into that is, making those little changes. And plus, I mean, attracting pollinators to your landscape makes your yard absolutely beautiful. I, I have a passion flower. I got it from uh, the plant sale at the Butterfly Museum. And I mean, talk about the, one of the coolest flowers ever. <laughs> so um, that, that to me is just like, that was a great plant to bring in, but you know, in the, so many of our others, like our, our native milkweeds are wonderful. They're great plants. Uh, they need good moisture, of course. Uh, but do you have any like uh, pollinator plants? If someone were to run out today and buy a pollinator plant that they could uh, bring into the landscape to attract, what would you recommend? Well, that's a tough one. Um, so you know, I have some, I have some of my favorites, but I, I I would instead of like recommending individual species, I think the best recommendation is for people to buy. You know, do a little bit of homework, buy what they want that they like, because it, it is about them. It's not about me or, or your preference. And, um, and really the, the three most important things when you're talking about your landscape is, you know, the amount of bloom that you have is really going to be important. It's going to be really, the more bloom, the more attractive it will be. Diversity definitely matters. The more types of flowers, colors, species you have, it's going to matter. And then the other thing that's often ignored is kind of that community evenness. So like if you have, you know, one of a hundred different plant species, that's very uneven. If you have 20 of five species, that's a pretty even community. And what we found from a lot of our research is those, that, that, that evenness is really critical. It really amplifies the impact of say the, the number of blooms that are available to pollinators, because I think it's, I think it's about visual attraction for a lot of these organisms. And so you know, think about just adding diversity as a good step. And then if you like five plants, buy three of them instead of just one of them and add them to your landscape. And those, those little changes can really have profound impact. Mm -hmm. I, and 
I think it's important to mention, and we all, we have resources available through EDIS. Um, I mean, biodiversity in insect population is wonderful, and you hit the nail on the head that biodiversity in our plant selection is important too, because you can prolong that flowering period as well by having different blooms in plants at different times of year. So you're able to have a nectar source or even a host source at different periods when it's needed. And I think that's an important thing to kind of point out that if you're wanting to start a butterfly garden, you know, we have the resources available where you can look at like what types of butterflies are you interested in and they have specific host plants. And those host plants are essentially vital as part of their reproduction cycle. And then those butterflies will also have preferences in certain nectar plants. Um, but that that list is really long to kind of talk about. It, it is. No, I know. And and but, but I, that, that's a good point that you just mentioned is, we know, we do live in Florida, which is, you know, a subtropical climate. So we do have insects, you know, butterflies and pollinators around 12 months of the year. So make sure that you have a, a landscape that has, you know, some bloom throughout all 12 months, not just, you know, May through October. And I think that's that's really critical. And then the other thing I'll say just about gardening for butterflies is we have over 190 different species of butterflies in Florida. So it's a big list of species and people often want to attract a particular butterfly species to the yard. And I would recommend instead, like buy some good nectar plants, put them in your landscape, buy a good field guide that you like, go out and just like watch the butterflies that come to your landscape. And then once you know sort of the, the most common ones, then you can go out and buy a host plant for those species. Because if That's you try a, to reverse engineer it, you're probably yeah. not going to be as successful. Mm -hmm. So just seeing what comes to the landscape and then come back in later. Yeah, because, oh, yeah. because it, you know, it, it, as you know, it varies whether you're in North Florida or South Florida. Maybe my house is adjacent to a swamp and your house is adjacent to an urban area. We're going to attract different butterflies based on where we live. So and, and it also gives you a really good excuse to get out and, and watch what happens in your landscape. That's really where the fun is. Like, you know, record, you know, come up with a, a species list of what butterflies are in your yard. Try to identify them, learn their behaviors, uh, and, and you'll just be much more connected to your own landscape. Your, your enjoyment factor will go way up. And, you know, it's not hard to do. Butterflies are not like birds. You don't need to get up at 8 a.m. to do it. You can you know, crawl out of bed, 10 a.m., go outside, pour yourself a cocktail, sit back and watch the butterflies come in. And it's super fun. That's nice. That, uh, I, one of my favorite memories is I used to work at a botanical garden years ago. Um, and there was a sedum garden. A garden is full of sedums. So Those are cooler climates. So we had like stone crop sedums, autumn joy. Uh, but you'd go over there and there would be they would, the flowers would be covered. You'd go up to one flower head and you would have five bees, a few moths, some butterflies, some flies, all walking around one flower head. And it's just like this beautiful little community on one plant. And it was, it was fascinating and I loved it. Um, so what I want to do is I, I, we need to conclude our time together. I want to invite you back because I want to spend more time talking about what's happening with the Butterfly Museum, and the wires too, and just learn more about that research that's happening because it's it's obviously not just you. It's there's a whole team there. There's a whole collection. But as we conclude the time together, I kind of want to ask, like, what would be that big tip if you were um, talking to a homeowner or someone in the community that is interested in lepidoptera or just pollinators? What is that big key nugget of information that you would like to share to them or with them? Well, I, I think the, the big takeaway is that you can make a difference. Like the actions that you do in your home landscape can make a make an impact. Uh, and that we have to, you know, don't, you have to look at landscapes differently, but, but really I can make a difference, you can make a difference. And I think that's critical because it, it needs to be empowering. And, you, you know, you know, like you said, that, that comment you made earlier, you, you bought this flower and even before you put it in the ground, there were bees or other insects on it. So that little action, even one or two plants, makes a difference. And you can see it happen. And I think that's the most critical thing, especially if you're trying to get 
get people involved that are, they don't have a lot of experience or they don't maybe know exactly how to start, but just start someplace, buy some flowering plants, put it out in your yard and, and enjoy it and watch what comes in and know that you can make a difference by those small actions. And hopefully that'll be a catalyst to, you know, getting you to do more, getting your neighbor excited, getting your community excited. And then we're really cooking with gas. We, we, we are making big changes, right? Yeah. That's awesome. It's like one little change can have a big rippling effect. So um, Dr. Daniels, I really appreciate you taking the time and coming and speaking with us with Extension Core today. And I really look forward to doing other recordings with you in the future. That sounds good. Thanks so much for having me, Taylor. Thank you very much. Thank you.